Well, thank you, Rodney. I appreciate the introduction, and I'm very pleased to be invited to join you this afternoon. Uh, Rodney was uh, perhaps suggesting that I've had lots of different jobs, but uh, amazingly, at least to me, uh, those, many of those jobs overlapped and were very well integrated with each other. So I think the, uh, the breadth of interest does not confine one to any single job um, role or life objective. And I think if those of you who are here today have lots of interests, I hope you can figure a, a way to integrate them. Uh, I find my role of mayor allows me to do that, and I'm uh, finding it to be the most stimulating and rewarding role that I've um, been involved with so far. Uh, I, I want to start by thanking Rodney and the travelers in this journey, the turning of the wheel. Uh, I think it's a marvelous concept, and I think it's really integral to the idea that we have uh, transdisciplinary education and um, the multiple departments and colleges working together in many disciplines. So please join me in giving Rodney a hand and his counterparts. <laughs> So um, when I was preparing for this talk, the first thing I uh, figured out was how clunky government can be. And so here's a picture, the diagram of what our local government looks like, and you can see it doesn't look anything like a wheel. Uh, I was also reminded uh, how linear the organizational structure appears and how little confidence the public seems to have these days in politics at all levels. So endeavoring to change that, at least at the local level, I started out with people as the common denominator. And I started to list the desirable characteristics, at least, that I could identify in our political figures, and I envisioned them, or us, as components of a wheel. Kind of messy. I think it's not quite so... Uh, um, mechanical as this, as we try to integrate all of these different ideas. I sort of had, I, when I started out, I had this kind of pre-Galilean geocentric vision of how things all fit together, this sort of stereotypical uh, Western materialistic concept with the self or the city as center. And as the concept evolved in my own mind, I started to see the hub as this sort of dense core of all that has happened and a repository of all that will ever, ever happen. It's rimmed by the expansive wholeness of being, the collective contributions of the spokes that Rodney spoke about just a moment ago. So from the political perspective, I view the hub in this model as being central, the cumulative impacts of our existence, the heart that sustains us. Uh, it sustains us uh, economically, emotionally, socially, environmentally, and spiritually. The spokes are our experiences and connections to each other over generations, spanning disciplines across neighborhoods, countries, continents, and uh, time. The, the rim symbolizes us here and now, ourselves as individuals, the we of community, the factions and composite of a nation, the generation of people, and the wheels, as Rodney said, also move. So they're part of the momentum of life. They cross generations and ecosystems and socio-political norms. Uh, I think I've referred to that as the ultimate in social networking. My, presence, uh, my presentation today will focus on life's journeys, the incremental destinations, some of the traveling companions who have influences, influenced policies, places, and our future. In the New York Times op-ed piece in 2000, it was just after the Bush-Gore hanging Chad fiasco, some of you may remember, the late John Mack, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning author and a psychiatrist, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, wrote about the role of trickster. And I think many of you here know trickster, the godlike character familiar to many cultures. Um, the, he's a troublemaker who can change the status quo when you least expect it. And Mack was interested in the transformative visionary experiences that connect spirituality to worldviews outside of our Western materialist paradigm, arguably like the spokes in a wheel. And for those who heard Rodney's introductory lecture to this series, I think you have a sense of that, that interrelationship that's very hard to define, but very real nonetheless. 
Mack wrote, quote, Trickster is Providence's representative, a kind of savior sent when society is in crisis and no longer serving the needs of its people. We seem to be living in the kind of historical moment when Trickster does his work. Perhaps he staged our political stalemate to enable new possibilities to emerge. I would say he could have as well been writing in 2012. Mack's expanded draft was explicit. He wrote, things will have to change as the discoveries of physics, biology, and other scientific disciplines reveal the profound interconnectedness of life, all life, our social institutions as always lag behind. Now it seems this nation is being afforded or offered an opportunity to renew itself, to rediscover its promise as a land where all have a chance of living healthy, fulfilling, and interesting lives. I suspect we may be headed towards something more collaborative, more authentically inclusive, but we cannot know that will emerge. Uncertainty is one of Trickster's creative tools. So I put to you today that Trickster is part of the wheel as political metaphor, and he accompanies us on our journey. One takes things with him on a journey and picks up more things along the way. And I have to tell you that uh, I'm finding myself these days shouldering some stereotypical and not always flattering baggage of being a politician. And it's not how I started out, not how I set out. And so I want to tell you what I started with. So first, the context that rims the worldviews of my generation. I'm a baby boomer. I was born in the 1950s with post-war enthusiasm fueling our nation to drive harder, to be bigger, better, richer, and more powerful than anyone else. When children responded to our classroom alarms, um, Pavlovian-like, just by rote, by ducking under our desks and covering our heads for protection from atomic bombs. My grandparents, two generations removed, lived with us. And I think this concept may be uh, unfamiliar to many of the students in the room today. But th we thought this was normal when I grew up in California. So from that background, I developed an acute awareness that materialism is part of our American society. I nonetheless came away with this uh, prevailing general sense of optimism and a willingness to weigh trust in authority versus healthy skepticism. Um, a shared uncertainty about our future, whether it's social security benefits, uh, nuclear warfare, or something else like climate change. And so how, how is that manifest in my role as mayor? I don't assume responsibility for all of these things, but I tend to be, or credit for it, I should say, but I tend to be realistically optimistic. I'm committed to long-range planning, to emergency preparedness, to conservative budgeting. And our community's collective experience is reflected in these coalition efforts we see everywhere to address poverty, to facilitate aging in place, and our efforts to be more sustainable, such as the city setting uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. So just as our predecessors left this place to us, so too shall we leave it for future generations. We are connected. And I think you'll see that signature wheel appearing through the course of this presentation. As I mentioned, I grew up in California where the divisions between the haves and the have-nots could be pretty stark unless you were a kid in the melting pot, in which case our hier hierarchies of power were determined by things like birth date, bullies, or the diameter of your bicycle wheel, and not anything so superficial, we thought, as skin color or the condition of one's clothes. We played kickball in the streets until it was too dark to see, and we regularly explored the marshes, the woods, the ponds, the grasslands, looking for snakes, lizards, crawdads, and mostly adventure. So through those experiences, I learned a lot about cultural and racial diversity, about inclusivity versus segregation, about the problems of bullying, about public safety, and programs and infrastructure to support active lifestyles. Locally, we see those uh, influences in our outreach through to schools through the school reader program, our school resource officer, the opportunities we have for youth engagement and volunteerism, and in the arts. Let me show you some more pictures of Moscow. Looks like I moved some slides around this morning. Take a look at those. We're talking about our historic connections and how we 
started someplace. We're moving through these historic opportunities. And these are student design projects for what Moscow might become in the future. So here we are to our safe routes to school, our active living task force, the bike for life activities. We have our Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, human right, uh, rights breakfast and our award ceremony. And we have our city increasingly recognized for its uh, vibrant lifestyle, the educated workforce, the uh, stimulating environment that the university brings to our community. And we can be proud, I think, of being inclusive, relatively diverse, especially for our state, and vigilant of threats to our social fiber. And I try to be a voice for those values. I was too young to understand Vietnam, except that it was the first time war appeared in people's living rooms, and that's uh, Walter Cronkite brought that to us. Um, in the 60s, the popular media suggested that women's liberation had something to do with burning bras. Once, when we were on our way to Disneyland, we got caught in the Watts riots, and I remember as a little girl looking out the car windows and seeing men in helmets um, with guns, fires in the streets, roadblocks, and then the next day, in keeping with that kind of surreal experience, we found ourselves ensconced in the Magic Kingdom. It was an amazing experience that was beyond me at the time, but I gradually came to understand the generational gaps, to the expectations of gender equity, the reality of racism, the hazards of violence in the streets, the power of peaceful protests, and the risks of irrationality and ignorance. Locally, we see those aspects brought to the fore by our University of Idaho Women's Center. We see it in our community walk, right there, our Human Rights Commission and the Human Rights Task Force. Uh, we have formative efforts for the Northwest Coalition for Human Rights. I think they just had a meeting yesterday afternoon or evening to get that, that formalized as a regional interest. Our community values peace over violence and witness the uh, peace vigils every Friday night in Friendship Square, or the uh, loud and uh, insistent, but mostly orderly megalod protests. I don't know if any of you saw those downtown. And I, I do want to offer kudos to our Moscow Police Department as well as to the protesters for the way that was managed, I think, upholding our hard-earned and carefully balanced constitutional rights matters in Moscow. I attended junior high with Steve Jobs, that was pre-Apple, many years pre-Apple, and we somehow survived a social climate when a public school sanctioned something called Slave Day Pants Day, when little girls were allowed to wear pants that one day of the year in exchange for little boys paying a quarter for the privilege of having us carry their books to class. Uh, I don't have any memory of carrying Steve Jobs' books, but I do now carry his iPad. So the take-home messages to me on that uh, experience are to imagine success and to overcome obstacles. And I'm still surprised when I go to grade schools in Moscow as a school reader and I hear girls say things like, I thought only boys could be mayors, or I told those boys our mayor was a girl. But uh, needless to say, I encourage all of the children of both genders to imagine their, uh, the greatest thing they want to do and to pursue those interests and their passions and their dreams. When I was a child, um, my journey took my mom and my brother and me to Boise, where we arrived on the day that Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. And it was different than we inspect, expected, uh, Boise, that is. And, uh, it was different from the stories our dad had told us growing up in Sandpoint. He, uh, he had a very different experience than what we encountered arriving in Boise in 1969 when sections of downtown were boarded up, uh, the sprawl was starting to take hold, the riverfront was a place where people emptied their crankcases, and that's obviously not the case anymore. Are there some folks here from Boise, some students from the... Treasure Valley, yeah. So a lot of very positive changes have, have occurred over those intervening years. But when we moved there, we had to live in a motel for two months because there wasn't any affordable housing to be had. I was a good student. I was respectful of authority. And then when I started out on my own, uh, attending college at that other institution Rodney mentioned under his breath, um, I uh, lived in an eight-foot wide trailer it was next to a row of board shacks, 
was behind a boisterous bar in Garden City. And kind of, as a matter of fact, I heard that somebody was uh, shot to death in the driveway the week before I moved in. Scary place to be. But my neighbors, who didn't have much, who lived in those shacks, decided they had enough to uh, share with me, and I felt valued. My landlord brought me a 50-pound sack of potatoes to keep me through the winter. So what I learned from that was that the pace, the magnitude, and the relative value of change is variable and can be influenced for good or ill. I learned that monetary worth is distinct from personal character, one's work ethic, and one's capacity for comp compassion. And I realized that education is a path to the future. So those experiences influence my advocacy for community giving and volunteerism for affordable housing and compact development. Uh, we hold the meetings to uh, enhance awareness of poverty in our area, to showcase the arts and cultural tourism and recreation and health and wellness and volunteerism as integral to our community's identity. We have uh, biannual citizen surveys to track the adequacy of the resources offered to our community members. When I was 22, I learned that uh, I started work, my nursing career is on a neurosurgical unit where meaningful lessons about life and death and fear and pain and anger and resolve arrived every day. I married an archeologist and surveyed the West, much of it on foot between Boise and Casper. We worked in, on digs, we lived in tents, we skinny dipped with our crewmates, we contracted dysentery from the river and enhanced our appreciation for people who lived before us, parts of a natural system intimately connected to the earth. I learned that the reasons behind people's actions and their emotional expression isn't always obvious, that walking in someone else's shoes helps you to understand them, and the fundamentals of life are pretty universal, clean air, clean water, food, and companionship. And I try to remember those things when people come to City Hall and to public hearings, and they're speechless, they're tearful, they're red in the face angry, or they're shouting. And they're, I think, are they afraid of losing something that's important to them? Are they outside of their familiar surroundings and their support system? Are they confused by all the political jargon and the complexity of the governmental process? Or are they just feeling like they're without options? So in each case, I always try to uh, remember that it's crucial that we remember to take care of the natural systems that take care of us. So Moscow became my home in 1980. And that's pretty light on my page, but I was, it was kind of begrudging at first because it was uh, stark. It was cold and gray and bare. And I'm thinking I can tough this out for two years maybe. The people and the culture and the vibrancy of this place warmed me and brightened my outlook. I remember folk dancing in what is now City Hall. I remember the travails of becoming a first-time homeowner by then in the process of a divorce spending everything I earned to make ends meet, and not having any health insurance despite being a nurse. I learned that first impressions, such as mine of Moscow, can be deceiving, that Moscow is made up of integrated parts held together by something mysterious, that hardworking people can be one crisis away from poverty, and that health insurance matters. In Moscow, we nurture our cultural assets, we do our best to help each other, Local health care resources include a variety of providers. Uh, we have the WAMI Medical Education Program. We have regional clinics that offer low to no cost health care. We have the Jeff and Becky Martin Community Wellness Center, Gritman Medical Center, which, by the way, wrote off $1.2 million in indigent care just last year. Uh, we, I look to that when we have uh, employee benefits discussions, too, because I think the city of Moscow should set an example for other employers, and I think um, pay and benefits uh, ought to be among those. As I became settled in Moscow, I took up running. I married my dog's ophthalmologist, who is back here. Wave your hand, Gary. There he is. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, he's a runner who fed my competitive spirit when he encouraged me to race and I discovered that I liked winning. When my mom got sick, we couldn't find medical or housing resources to meet her needs or our expectations, so I left my job 
and I went to Boise to provide care for her in her home. I used most all of my nursing skills and I learned a lot about home health care and insurance and I could only imagine the challenges that others face uh, when they encounter those situations and they don't come from such a background. I learned that common interests link us together, that life skills are transferable, such as running foot races and running campaigns, and I learned that jobs, aging parents, and healthcare resources affect workers' choices and our larger economy. Local resources that offer a foothold include, let's see what we have there, my own home, we also have the uh, uh, Area Agency on Aging. We have Gritman's Adult Day Health, uh, Human Needs Council, senior programs, and senior meals. But there are still significant gaps to be filled. And for those of you who are not familiar with my own home, I encourage you to take a look at that. It's an opportunity for people to stay in their homes and to have the services needed to, to be able to uh, remain there safely, uh, nourished, uh, spiritually, uh, socially, and uh, food-wise as well. So after I took care of my mom, I returned to my husband and to our uh, fledgling new business uh, and decided at age 45 that I was going to take a class at the University of Idaho. And it, was a, it altered the, my path and it changed my life. Steve Drown taught a class called Issues for the Emerging Landscape, and I was simultaneously comfortable and invigorated by that opportunity. And I went on, as Rodney said, to earn my master's in environmental science in 2002. And uh, I, you know, as a non-traditional student, I felt warm and welcome. I didn't feel like an oddball on this campus, and I think that's a tribute to this residential campus atmosphere, to the community outreach that our institution affords us. So I appreciate that, and, and I hope that you're giving a similar welcome to other non-traditional students in your classes. Um, it, I accepted a part-time job, as Rodney alluded to, as administrative assistant for the Humanities Fellows Program, Sense of Place in the Pacific Northwest, Time, Memory, and Imagination. And that experience was transformative for me. The program was self-limited, but the relationships that it fostered were not, and that includes mine with Rodney. They persist to this day. Thank you. So my take-home messages were to keep learning, to stay curious, and to find connections. And today's presentation is part of that network. The university and the local government regularly collaborate on mutually beneficial uh, services, like police and fire protection, the streets maintenance, the co-marketing of events, uh, supporting one another's uh, grant proposals, the recognition ceremonies we do, the arts and tourism and sustainable infrastructure, and the community volunteerism, such as you see here with SYNC, the Serving Your New Community program. So with, within government, I always try to make the structure more wheel-like by linking departments and volunteerism through common objectives. And our university classes regularly uh, do outreach to the, the community at large uh, with uh, planning and design build concepts, with uh, volunteer service, and other real life applications for all of us. And so how did I arrive at this place? Well, um, in 2003, some acquaintances who were anxious for political change thought were looking for candidates they thought could bring it. And so I agreed to run for the two-year term. This is kind of like how I moved to Moscow and ended up being, you know, toughing it out for two years, and here I am 32 years later. Uh, in this case, I thought, well, I can tough this out. It's a two-year term. How bad could it be? You know, my, the extent of my public engagement at that point was to write letters to the editor and to vote. And I hadn't uh, aspired to politics, but once in that position, I found I liked it and I think I was good at it. So uh, hopefully I still am. Uh, but I agreed to run for that two-year seat on the city council. And at the same time, John Dickinson, who was the former chair of computer science, you probably can't really recognize him from that image on the left there, but uh, John uh, was also a political newbie, and he'd made a decision to run for one of the four-year seats on city council, and he had decided to because his, one of his graduate students, Sami Omar Ahusayan, had been accused of terrorism, 
and it would take 17 months before he was exonerated. Uh, John stood with him all the way, as did many others in our university community. And that experience, just observing the actions of government, the power and influence of government, motivated John to become involved himself. Um, and his, his enthusiasm, his wide-ranging interests were contagious, to me at least, I think to many others, and John contributed many spokes to our common wheel. He once taught a course about time, and stu his students studied calendars and, they, and clocks, and they talked about what it means to spend or waste time. John noted that the very nature of time is asymmetric. We know the past, but cannot change it. We are ignorant of the future, but we can affect it, sometimes with the slightest action or inaction. Shortly after John was elected city council president, he died in, while rendering aid in an auto accident. And his influence was and remains profound. So what I, I I'm reminded that uh, from that experience that comfort zones are overrated, that principles count, and that failure to act is to have made a choice. The message was powerful to me. Take time to do things well. Expand the effort to truly listen to the public and an array of ideas before rendering decisions that affect them. Be serious when you must, but keep your ego in check. We are finding commonality, and to borrow a term from a University of Idaho instructor Ron Walters, transdisciplinary connectedness to address big challenges together. And those are the connections that I have in, in the wheel of my journey. They're what I bring to service in elected office. And mine is the example that I know best. Um, but when I talk about these spokes and connect them to the hub in the context of public service, I want, I want you to think about other uh, stereotypes of politicians, the people whose reputations and motives seem morphed overnight um, the day following their election. And there was an Irish playwright named Sean O'Casey who wrote a little about that. He said, I don't know why, but politics seems to have a tendency to separate us, to keep us from one another, while nature is always and ever making efforts to bring us together. So try to think about those uh, political figures as fellow travelers in our journey. Consider the ways their spokes, their families, their friends, their jobs, and their co-workers are connected to them and connect them to us. Think about what skills and interests you have uh, and, uh, and how they could be applied to this metaphorical wheel and the wheel building that we aspire to do together. Consider running for office, consider volunteering for the community, and I, as I mentioned before, this place in my journey is the most interesting, uh, the most fulfilling I've had as yet. And we each contribute something to the composition of the wheel. By virtue of my elected office, some of the things I carry with me are more obvious than others, but sort of like those uh, TSA inspectors at the airport who like to reveal the uh, most intimate contents of your luggage when you, to everybody standing there. I think, uh, I think Trickster would find that funny too, actually. But political figures are targeted for similar revelations. And I think uh, simply because we're lumped into this sort of homogenous category that's reviled, that we're perceived as being self-serving boneheads. And I would say that uh, allowing that some of us actually may be, some among us may be, please consider those of us who are not, and we're all part of the same wheel, each with different spokes. So please take a look at this list and see, reflect on that for yourselves. I know you're, many of you in this room are aspiring to complete your educational programs, but as I mentioned at the outset, it's, it need not be an either-or capacity. You can be involved at a variety of levels to suit your schedules, your skills, your interests. Um, but we all come from some place. We bring different um, relationships. We bring different skill sets. Um, so kind of look back on your own life and see where you've come from, where you are, and where you aspire to be, and how you can serve the, the greater world in some capacity. Whether, like me, you've chosen the local level, or as someone I was talking to at the outset today, just before the, the presentation, looking at international relations. 
Um, so I think we have great uh, energy in this room, great capability, and I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next. So I thank you for your attention, and I know we have a few minutes, I think, for uh, some questions here, some just live interaction. Thank you, Jim. We have a, a lot of folks we work with together, and I, I, I met Jim Eakins, uh, who just exited, but with Palouse Clearwater Environmental Institute, and that's one of those uh, organizations, the nonprofit 501c3, that uh, put, is responsible for many of those blue tubes you all see around. Has anybody been out on the Chipman Trail to see that? Uh, the revegetation programs to reduce erosion and, and sediment deposition in the water uh, supplies. And at the same time, so the city works with them, they do environmental education in our schools, uh, the city contracts with them to provide that resource. That's the next generation of leaders and policy makers uh, and scientists. And at the same time, as all of this is happening, the Environmental Protection Agency is saying, you shall manage stormwater quality. And so guess what? Something as simple as blue tubes may save us hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines if only we can sort of perpetuate that sort of an effort. So when we think there are some simple pieces, when you add them all together, they have huge effects, not just monetary ones, but in terms of looking toward uh, future generations and leaving them something that is is workable. Um, we, we don't want to mess up too badly. And I think that's one of the things I've looked at in my role as mayor is just don't upset the apple cart. Moscow is a fabulous place. It has so many assets and they're, it's very difficult to define how they are so well integrated. But the idea is let's take care of this and just not mess up a good thing. And as we can protect it for future generations, I think that's uh, perhaps the best thing we can do now. Anybody? Okay. So what majors do we I'm gonna quiz you now. So if you're not Rodney, you tell me when I when the shepherd's crook needs to come out here. But uh, okay, so what do we have in the front row? What's your major in the Idaho sweatshirt? Exercise science and health humane. Okay, there you go. So we were talking about health care and the challenges and um, medical students especially will graduate with huge amounts of debt. We have a, a, I just had this conversation this morning with a candidate for our state legislature. What are the issues that we're facing? And one of them is affordable education, and the other is having more general practitioners, family practitioners, and internists uh, to provide health care for my generation of baby boomers, who are very demanding, by the way. Uh, but, but how do we help you get through school so that you can carry on. One of the programs the University of Idaho participates in is the WAMI program, Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. And it's a medical education program connected, there's that word again, connected to the University of Washington Medical School. And so we have students who are in states or regions that don't have medical schools, but this partnership has made it possible for us to do that. And the number of returning graduates who have done their training in our small, small rural communities of Idaho or smaller, medium-sized communities like Moscow are more likely to return there upon graduation, uh, upon completion of residency programs because they're familiar with it and they know they can make a meaningful difference. So that's, that's one place where we have a connection. What about you? What's your major? Mathematics, well, where would we be without you, right? Uh, we, we're just starting budget conversations in the city of Moscow and trying to figure out how to stretch limited dollars and to provide the kinds of services and infrastructure that a community needs really depends on a balanced budget. And unlike our federal government, cities in Idaho are obligated to have balanced budgets each year. And that can, that's a tough, tough time for us because we're having to make choices. We're having to make choices about parks and recreation resources. We're having to make choices about, uh, you know, beautification of our downtown. Uh, we patch together funding streams. Uh, we bring money in from uh, grants. The city has a grants coordinator who helps us 
uh, draw dollars, and I think recently we brought in about one point six million or something like that for this intermodal transit center that's going to go in right there at you know Sweet Avenue and College Street. Do you know where that or Sweet Avenue and Railroad Street? Sorry. Um, Anybody know where that is? Yeah? Okay. So we're going to have a place there where all modes of transportation can come together. We'll have Northwestern Trailways, we'll have our Moscow Transit buses, we'll have Dial-A-Ride and the, uh, the Vandal Access Shuttle, we'll have bicycle pedestrian connectivity and the taxi services, the independents coming together. Um, so that we can say we're trying to be as efficient as we can with the limited dollars we have and to build those partnerships and the coalitions. The uh, students at the University of Idaho, uh, maybe some of you were among them, uh, voted themselves uh, a, a cut of their, their student fees to go toward transit services, recognizing that something in excess of 60% of the ridership of Moscow Transit is student, uh, student, probably faculty and staff as well, uh, related to U of I. And, and so that's a very good thing for us. Uh, talking about numbers, when, when I started with city council, I think our investment in public transit was around 12, $10 or $12,000 a year. Then it went up to 20 and 40 and um, 80. And this year, they're going to be asking for $110,000 uh, as the city's share of transit and then inviting that same participation from partners, including our medical and business community and others. So, and you knew I was gonna call on you next, right? Yeah, physics, and since you probably have anything to say about physics, I'll ask a question. Please do, <laughs> there you go. You didn't want me to put you on the spot, go for it. So, yeah. um, uh, some people you know, like do a lot of city planning, like you know, where, where should we, you know, how do we wanna grow the city or whatnot? Do you find yourself doing much of that or is it mostly just, you know, how do we do, take care of Moscow between now and December? Ah. This is a challenge because I tend to be the big picture, long range, holistic kind of thinker and the practical, practicality of day to day business says you have to get this done and this done and this done. And so there's a little bit of that you know, balancing that has to happen. And, but I do think as, as Rodney was talking about, the rel this is a physics point too, the relative strength of each of the spokes making the wheel turn better. I think we have to balance our short and long, short, mid and long range planning to, to make the city work. One of the big challenges that we're looking at right now, besides the stormwater piece, um, is sustaining the region's water supply. And we've had that conversation uh, in, around this room before. But there's some interest in possibly putting surface water into the Grand Ronde Aquifer. Well, what are the long range implications of that? We know we're not going to poison anybody tomorrow with that that choice because after all we're required to treat water to drinking water standards and uh, it won't have coliform bacteria and those kinds of scary things that we recognize now but the gaps in the rulemaking for the Department of Environmental Quality for the Environmental Protection Agency are to allow for those so-called emerging contaminants the the plasticizers the endocrine disruptors those things that will potentially cause reproductive disorders, cancers, eventual death in people, but we don't know how or when, we don't know about the concentrations and the uh, bi you know, biochemical effects over time, genetic effects over time. So that's a long-term decision, but we have this short-term urgency to figure out what we're gonna do for our sustainable water supply in the basin. And some people are saying, hey, it's a great idea. Just, let's just put our surface water right in the ground. I'm not among those. So, you know, I, and that everybody brings some background. Everybody brings their interests and skills. And my fields in human medicine, in social sciences, and in environmental science tell, inform me in some ways. But some of my colleagues who are, you know, we, we have the capability of doing things. We can do them. The question many times is, should we do them? And that's where we strike a balance, and that's why we have representative government. So, good question, thank you. Anybody else here want to wing one out there? I see a hand coming up, please. Right, <laughs> okay, would you like to stand and like <laughs> wave your arms or? What did we do to deserve a mayor like you? Oh, D does that mean a good thing or a bad <laughs> thing? <laughs>
come how medical in some of my classes, and there might, there might be some interesting stuff to share there. I would be pleased to. And as Rodney indicated, we'll have this posted on the, uh, is it on the Malcolm Renfrew Interdisciplinary Colloquium site or particular to the turning of the wheel? But the URL is on here as well. Okay. Oh, I just don't want to turn you loose early. Uh, I do have some business cards with me, so anybody who uh, thinks of a question or a comment later, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. And I, I welcome calls. My, this is Moscow. My home number's on my business cards, too. So thank you, everybody, for your attention. It was my privilege to be able to talk with you today.